Well, let me start with my apologies for those of you who may be uh, watching us uh, online this evening. Um, there's some reports that uh, have come out within the past uh, few days about how far the world beh is behind in its efforts to address climate change uh, and environmental justice. Uh, and uh, we had some uh, conversations in the uh, session that precedes this that inevitably brought up some ethical questions, and so we're running a little late. Uh, so we hope you understand that. Um, I uh, will also uh, make a follow-up announcement uh, concerning the rising tides um, environmental justice conference, which will be taking place here on campus um, on Friday morning and into the afternoon of uh, uh, next Friday, November 4th. Um, we will be uh, meeting in our uh, campus ballroom, uh, and our keynote speaker uh, will be Senator Ed Markey, uh, who is the author of legislation on uh, environmental justice. So we're very fortunate uh, to uh, be in a position where he'll be on campus um, in the week before the election uh, talking about uh, a number of reports that um, have indicated that we have even more work to do to achieve environmental justice, the, in, environmental justice than we thought we had to do even a week ago. Um, and with that, um, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, uh, Leah Bamberger, uh, I think you may have seen on our site uh, some information about her background, but she's worked with uh, the city of Boston and Providence, um, and now we're extremely fortunate to have her uh, here on the Northeastern campus, um, overseeing and engaging with all of the issues that a major stakeholder institution such as uh, Northeastern University has, uh, both internally and in terms of our wider community in addressing issues of climate change and justice. So uh, without further ado, Leah, you're on. Thank you. Thank you. Pull up the slides here. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so again, sorry, it's a lot of buttons here to press. Um, my name is Leah Bamberger, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Executive Director of Northeastern's Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub. Um, I'll talk more about the hub. We're new um, and very excited to be here and part of the Northeastern community. Um, I want to just give a quick shout out to my team. Um, I guess Megan Curtis Murphy, who is here today, uh, is our Director of Campus Sustainability. And, and actually, there's an error there, it's engagement. Um, and so hopefully many of you uh, have a chance to meet her. Uh, Jacob Glickel is Director of Sustainable Operations. Um, we have a couple co-op students, Alana Lane, uh, who does our social media and marketing. If you don't already follow us on Instagram or Twitter um, or LinkedIn, I, I hope you'll join us there. Um, Brittany Siegel is our Project Coordinator, and uh, Daria Healy is our uh, content creation as student workers. So we have um, some great stories coming out on our website and our newsletter, um, all in an effort to share some of the work that we're doing. Um, we're also hiring, which is very exciting. There are two positions um, on, on, uh, online right now that are open, and I'm very excited to grow our team um, and expand the work. So back in 2007, um, Northeastern University made a commitment to uh, climate and sustainability and uh, pledged to ensure that sustainability will be a factor um, in, and help guide all of our decisions. Um, and we also were one of the founding members um, or signatories of the American College and University President's Climate Commitment. So we've been at this work for a long time. Um, the Office of Sustainability 
started this effort uh, back uh, around this time and in 2010 uh, created the university's first climate action plan. The work has evolved, as I'm sure you, you've noticed, and uh, this past year, uh, the Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub was, was launched. Um, we launched in the spring of this year, so again, we're very new. Um, and our mission is to help bring forward and carry forward Northeastern's commitments on climate justice and sustainability. And um, we do that not only by ensuring that the campus is sustainable, but that we're also um, connecting to research and practice, bridging those components of the work, and also connecting people, our campuses, and community. So it's not just about what's happening within our campuses, whether here in Boston or elsewhere throughout the global system, but it's about bridging that work and connecting it to what's happening off campus and making sure that Northeastern is contributing to the climate movement, um, and also um, the third sort of component is that we're leading by example. So again, that kind of gets back to the campus sustainability work, um, and I'll talk more about that. So um, as I mentioned, we had a 2010 climate action plan, which is quite a few years ago. Um, so in the past uh, two years, there was an effort uh, by the office, led, started by the Office of Sustainability to update that plan. And about a year ago, um, the Office of Sustainability, which is now the hub, um, started engaging the Northeastern community on what's important to them related to climate action here on campus. And we heard loud and clear from students and faculty that justice and equity should be centered, needs to be centered in that plan. Um, so we started, um, from, from that, we um, realized that you know, we really needed to shift the direction um, of the plan in, in order to make sure that justice was a core part of it. And we needed to think beyond just what's important to the Northeastern community, but we also had to be connecting um, and be doing the work in relationship with our neighbors and with climate justice leaders and environmental justice leaders from the Boston area. And so here are a few of um, some of the community priorities and concern that we've already heard. The, this is from um, some early uh, feedback in the institutional master plan process that uh, the university is also undertaking right now. Um, so, I mean, these are probably not of a great surprise to anybody. There are concerns about affordable housing, gentrification, displacement, uh, youth programs, and access to quality education, workforce development, um, supporting local businesses and the local economy, uh, and neighborhood infrastructure and green spaces. So these are all things that uh, our neighbors have shared that are their priorities and concerns related to Northeastern University. And so what we heard from the Northeastern community, um, you'll see there's a lot of alignment, actually, which is really encouraging. Um, there's awareness of our impact on surrounding communities. Uh, there is um, interest in uh, inclusive engagement and decision-making, um, renewable energy, equity, uh, and, and justice. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for alignment. Um, and, uh, and, and sort of connecting those various um, interests. We also heard from faculty, um, and uh, right around the same time, the Faculty Senate launched a Climate Justice Action Committee um, with, with this charge of developing a definition for climate justice, a communication strategy, recommendations for that updated climate action plan, as well as specific steps to help Northeastern move those actions forward. So this is the, the definition that uh, that committee came up with. Climate justice is an approach to climate action that redresses the legacies of exploitation and injustice that have resulted in sharply unequal vulnerabilities to climate risks, both locally and globally. Climate justice action requires transformative systems level change that integrate multiple kinds of knowledge linking technological and social innovation 
in ways that prioritize social, racial, and economic equity. So this is a great definition, some, uh, one that we will, I think, rely on um, and help guide our work going forward. They also went a step further to help us think about the context of climate justice in higher education. And so um, some of the key points that were made are around this, the university's commitment um, to a, being a more equitable, inclusive, diverse, and accessible community within the Northeastern community, ending fossil fuel reliance, and expanding our commitment to partnering with and, and centering the needs of underinvested in communities and communities of color. And lastly, ensuring that our strategies and actions are aligned with and responding to the needs and priorities of broader networks of non-academic communities. So again, those, that piece about bridging what's happening on campus in the Northeastern community to the movement and our neighbors and those who are most impacted. So based on a lot of this feedback that we heard from students, faculty, and community members, um, we identified these four goals to help guide our work going forward. The first is that our campuses should strive to be models of sustainable, healthy, and inclusive communities. We have this like fifth, four and a half, fifth goal, the uh, fossil fuel free by 2040. It's a, definitely a part of a sustainable campus, but it's a really important part, so we want to highlight that. Um, our, uh, we, Northeastern should contribute to a just and regenerative economy, both locally and globally. We will collaborate with adjacent communities to continue, uh, to, uh, sorry, contribute to equitable and sustainable neighborhoods, and we'll leverage research and academic strength to advance just and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. So these are draft goals. Um, they are based on some initial feedback and input from the Northeastern community and our neighboring communities. But we have a, a, quite a long road ahead to develop that relationship with community and make sure that we're collaborating and um, being inclusive of um, particular um, frontline communities who are most impacted by the climate crisis. So they're still draft, and we want to continue to get feedback and shape them as we go. So a little bit about um, some things that are already occurring on campus and just to provide some color to these goals and what we're doing presently to move towards them. Um, we have, I'll start with uh, waste. So currently our waste diversion rate is 44%, which is pretty good, but we have certainly room to improve. Um, November 1st, actually in the state of Massachusetts, a, uh, a textile waste ban is going, to, uh, going into effect. So very important to know and tell your friends you can no longer put uh, textiles, clothing, et cetera, in the trash. Um, so we're going to be rolling out some op options for textile recycling. The city already has some programs in place for that. We're also, we've been expanding composting on campus. Uh, there's an East Village program running right now for those living there. It's been very popular, a uh, high participation rate, um, and really love seeing how passionate students are um, and, and are enjoying the opportunity to um, divert their food waste from their dorm rooms. On the transportation front, uh, of course, Northeastern is pretty well situated with regard to public transportation. About 95% of students take public transportation or um, some mode other than getting in a car and driving alone to get to campus. Among faculty and staff, the number is 67%, so still pretty good, but again, some room for improvement. Um, but we are working with the university to help expand um, opportunities for alternative modes of transportation, um, things like access, uh, increasing access to blue bikes. Um, of course, there's already some great discounts in place for that. Um, electric vehicle charging on campus is an important strategy that we're expanding, um, and, and many others. So that's a, a partnership with the university that we're um, a big part of it is just helping folks know what those options are and making sure they're accessible. Um, the campus arboretum is a very important part of a sustainable and healthy uh, campus. So we're very um, fortunate to have such a great team led by Steve Schneider, um, enhancing the greenery on our campus and uh, benefiting from the many, many benefits of an enhanced tree canopy from mitigating heater, uh, urban heat island effect, 
air quality improvements, and um, just that pleasant you know, connection to nature here in a very urban environment. Um, and expanding similarly, you know, we have these culinary herb gardens, there's student gardens that are being expanded on campus, so lots of different ways that we're trying to in increase that connection um, to nature. Our greenhouse gas emissions, we've been tracking this data since 2005, and you can see they have gone down um, about 27% since that time. Um, over that same time period, the campus has expanded by 28%. So we've been able to uh, pretty significantly reduce our carbon footprint while continuing to grow the campus. Um, and over the past couple years, since 2020, we have, uh, the university has um, procured carbon offsets for all of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions generated from the built environment. And um, in terms of that new, new development and new construction, uh, the way, the, one of the reasons that we've been able to grow and still reduce our emissions is because new projects are really enhancing the overall energy efficiency of our campus. As you may know, um, ISIC uh, is lead gold and forthcoming EXP is striving for uh, lead silver, or sorry, lead platinum certification, the highest level. Um, our, our expanding um, global system here uh, in Portland is where this photo or rendering is from. And um, that development is going above and beyond certification programs and is striving to be completely fossil fuel free. Speaking of the global network, we're excited to welcome um, our, our newest member of the family, the Oakland campus, Mills College. And um, if you get an opportunity to spend some time there, I highly recommend it. It is not only a historically significant place, but also very ecologically significant to the community there in Oakland. It has a two and a half acre farm on campus that provides fresh produce to the campus community. Um, both in terms of in the um, dining services, but also there's a farm stand on campus, I believe it's every Tuesday, and there's also a CSA that um, community members can participate in. Uh, there's also a creek that goes through the campus. It's one of the only daylit creeks um, in the area. Uh, so it's very, again, ecologically significant, and there's many opportunities to um, do, uh, they host creek restoration days, um, and so stewardship of the land there is a very um, big part of the sustainability programs, and we're really excited to learn from them and exchange ideas and um, grow our, our resources. So contribute to a just and regenerative economy. Um, this is an area that uh, we have um, a handful of, of, of programs and, and uh, efforts already underway. Of course, there's certainly room for improvement, but um, we have our composting vendor, Sarah, which is a Dorchester-based uh, worker-owned co-op. So they are the ones that are hauling all of our food scraps and organic waste away from campus. Uh, we have a partnership with Madison Park High School in uh, the technical school in Boston, where we uh, work with interns in their senior year there. They work in our trades and services department, and many of them then go on to um, become full-time employees of the university. The Underground Cafe uh, is a uh, woman-owned, black-owned black business uh, partnership um, as well. Hopefully you are a patron there um, and had the opportunity to visit. Uh, but these are sort of the ways that we're starting to really expand and try to have an increased economic um, positive impact on the surrounding community. And then um, the third goal, collaborating with adjacent communities to contribute to equitable and sustainable neighborhoods. Um, certainly the entire Climate Justice Action Plan is really striving to do this, but of course there are some examples of ways that we're already doing this. These open classrooms are one great example, there are many more. Um, we also have launched um, are starting to host uh, electric vehicles that are uh, car share, the good to go car share. Um, they have discounted rates for low income residents and members of the community can um, reserve those vehicles similar to Zipcar. Um, so we partnered with them to host those here on campus 
for both the Canvas community and our neighbors to use. Carter Field is a $100 million investment. That was a community benefit um, from the last institutional master plan. And um, we're, as I mentioned earlier, we are starting to do a new institutional master plan. And we're going to be looking at additional community benefits um, and the impact of those benefits. And lastly, um, leveraging research and academic strengths to advance just and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. Being new to Northeastern I was, and, and getting to know the Northeastern community, I was really blown away by all the different um, faculty and students and researchers who are engaged in real world problem solving and the partnerships um, that are already in place to uh, solve real world problems. So there's many, many examples of this already happening. And I would just emphasize that the hub is really here to just help elevate and provide shape to those efforts. Um, and it's, uh, we're still sort of learning and growing and, and uh, wrapping our arms around all the great work that's already happening in this space. So um, the climate, action, or climate justice action planning process is uh, really just beginning. I mentioned we started this a year ago and hearing from the Northeastern community, and it was really the Northeastern students and faculty who helped push us to this point now where we are talking about a climate justice action plan. Um, so kudos to everyone who uh, helped with that, including Professor Landmark, Landmark here. Um, but we are um, sort of paused a little bit in the past year to make sure that we had a process that would live up to that name and that we were really centering the needs of frontline communities um, in our planning process. So we went out um, to, to get partners and um, we, did, through a competitive bid process, teamed up with One Square World, which is um, a consultant that provides community-centered planning and policy development, facilitation, um, training and movement support towards uh, equity and sustainability. They've been a really great partner. They are also a firm that I had the privilege of working with um, back in my previous role in the city of Providence where we developed Providence's climate justice plan. So a lot of experience in this space. And we also partnered with ACE, Alternatives for Community and Environment, which is a uh, local grassroots environmental justice organization. They're actually um, based uh, very close by in Roxbury. And they are going to be um, charged with running the community engagement and outreach component. So um, what, one of the things we struggled with uh, in developing this process is thinking about how do we build, do this work in relationship with frontline communities, but not uh, be exploitive or ex extractive of their efforts. So we know that these um, organizations and organizers um, have a lot of important work to do and don't necessarily have the resources to do everything that they're asked to do. Um, and we also know that um, developing Northeastern's Climate Justice Action Plan probably isn't uh, one of their top priorities right now. Um, but we um, came up with a, a process that we, we think addressed that. But the first, um, I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about that, our goals and outcomes. And the first goal, and this is really important throughout the entire process, is to ensure that our process is accountable to community. And specifically, frontline communities are those who are most impacted by the climate crisis. So we're going to do that by developing a steering committee that will have community members, um, both from Northeastern as well as our neighboring communities. And that's going to start very soon and run through the end of the project in uh, the spring of 2024. The second goal is to um, ensure that everyone participating in the process has a shared foundational understanding of the intersecting issues of climate, sustainability, structural oppression, racism, um, and, and other intersecting issues so that as we go through this process, we don't fall into the trap of um, not 
uh, of sort of staying on the, on the surface and not getting to really the root causes of the climate crisis. It's important to have that share, those shared definitions and shared understanding of those intersecting issues so we can really dig in and uh, work together to come up with um, powerful solutions. The third goal is, and this is what I was speaking to earlier about ACE's role, um, where we're going to identify, uh, work with ACE to identify priorities and concerns of frontline communities in the Boston area. And um, so ACE will be running that process, and they are going to come up with uh, organizing within their communities to come up with those priorities and concerns. Of course, they're being paid to do this work, but also, regardless of what Northeastern does, this is organizing work that should be of value to them either way. And we, furthermore, we hope to um, partner and share this information with other local institutions so that not every institution who wants to engage in climate justice is going to the same organizers, asking the same questions, and taking up more of their time. The fourth goal is, of course, to develop the vision, the goals, and the strategies for our climate justice uh, work. So this will happen um, not for a year, so it's a long timeline, and I'll talk more about the importance of that later. Um, and then lastly, we'll develop that final plan and uh, making sure we're circling back every step with that steering committee and um, with uh, community partners to confirm that we are being accountable and responding to their priorities and concerns. So um, a few things that I think makes this process unique um, and uh, just to draw attention to the ways in which that we are trying to decenter Northeastern in this and really make sure we're centering um, justice and, and frontline communities throughout the process is that one, we are resourcing uh, those frontline, um, frontline led community organizations, ACE in particular. ACE will be compensated to do this work. They will have resources to provide stipends to other organizers that they're working with. Um, and again, that piece around um, sharing and opening the process with other Boston area institutions, and we hope to include them in some of those training and educational workshops in the beginning so that they're part of that foundational knowledge and that we don't um, come get to this point where, you know, because there are many other institutions that are really interested in doing this work um, and we know that the organizers don't have uh, the capacity or it's just not a priority to help every single college or university individually in the Boston area uh, understand and address climate justice. So we want to be collaborative um, with our other institutional partners in the area and help make even better use of the organizer's time and effort. And the realistic timeline, timelines can be oppressive, deadlines can be oppressive. Um, ours is long and I think that's very important to help build in time for relationship building and enable us to really move at the pace of trust. Trust is always a challenge. There's um, there's, not, there's often not much trust between a, a large institution, whether it's government or a hospital, or in this case, a large university, and it's uh, neighboring communities. So we know we have work to do, and we know that we're gonna need time to build that trust so we can do this work in right relationship with community. So um, that is a good, well, not necessarily, you can tell me if it's good, but that was a quick overview of the Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub, our Climate Justice Action Plan, and the work that's ahead. I hope um, you will all join us in this effort, and i um, looking forward to the questions and discussion. Pretty good. <laughs> More than pretty good, quite ambitious, <laughs> I would say. Um, how did you come to do this work? That's a good question. Um, so I, I think maybe our microphones are too close. Um, I've always been very passionate about the environment. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Boston, which afforded me um, great 
access to the outdoors, and it was a very important part of my childhood. But then I also started learning about climate change and um, decided that I would never live in the suburbs again, um, and uh, promptly became very interested in urban sustainability through the lens of, of urban planning. Um, and really um, struggled with this idea of cities being more sustainable in some regards, but also the role of nature and, and how uh, we can live in cities and live in more efficient communities while also staying connected to nature and, um, and, and holding on to those values that at least were very important to me. Um, so in my work uh, on urban sustainability, both with Boston, but more, uh, more so with the city of Providence, I um, started to um, understand and learn more about, uh, or just recognizing, I guess, my own privilege in that access to nature and um, understanding how many of the people in my position, in my field, didn't look like the populations of the cities that we were working to make more sustainable. And that disconnect um, is pretty, is extreme. Uh, and uh, in Providence in particular, um, when I started there, there was, um, I was kind of just learning about the communities there, the issues there. I moved from Boston to Providence. And um, looking at the work that had been a focus of the Office of Sustainability and the previous sustainability plan, there was a big disconnect between that and the issues that were being raised by, in particular, um, BIPOC communities in Providence, the Port of Providence, the pollution, air quality. Um, these issues are often not the priority of uh, urban sustainability initiatives. And um, we launched a process to um, explore how we would shift our work so that it really centered justice and equity. Um, and through that process, um, there were many anti-racism trainings that we hosted, um, and those were very impactful um, for me and um, really changed the way I understood the work and the issues around sustainability and how racism is, is so much at the core of the exploitive nature um, and uh, of climate change and the really root cause of, of the issue. Talk, talk a little bit about Providence in terms of its uh, demographics. It's a small city. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has a number of uh, uh, universities, as Boston does. Uh, it's on the coast. Um, and it uh, is a fairly diverse city. Mm -hmm. um, but one doesn't necessarily think of it, uh, or at least uh, until very recently, one hasn't thought of it as a city that was necessary, necessarily on the forefront of sustainability and resilience and, and those kinds of things. So what happened in Providence that um, turned it from being a city where People were thinking mostly of art and and uh, uh, the uh, ethnic communities and the like to a city that was uh, is now uh, committed to doing work in terms of sustainability and resilience and particularly community engagement around those. Yeah, well, we really flipped the community engagement process on its head um, when we were developing the climate justice plan. Um, we knew that if we were to just go and do a typical process of holding public meetings, even if we hosted them in the more diverse communities or the lower income communities, we were still going to get the usual suspects. And we did a um, survey um, at one point, and part of the survey was just open and online. And then part of the survey we worked with, um, we created this racial and environmental justice committee that was made up of um, BIPOC community leaders, and um, they did their own surveying of their communities, like bringing paper surveys to, you know, cookouts and and very like grassroots organizing. And we compared the results and the demographics. And the online survey that we put out through our channels um, was mostly mostly white, 
respondents, mostly from the east side or even outside of Providence. Um, and so we didn't do that um, traditional, let's just host open public meetings. We were very intentional about engaging the communities that had not been engaged on these issues. And it's certainly not that they don't have opinions or priorities or concerns related to climate or sustainability. They were just either never asked or um, never given the opportunity to respond to the issues in a way that um, made sense for their uh, lived experiences. So that survey, we asked very simple questions. We asked, how do you stay warm in the winter? What do you like about that? What don't you like about that? How do you stay cool in the summer? What do you like about that? What don't you like about that? How do you get around the city? What's good about that? What would you like to change? And then lastly, is there anything in your community that's making you sick? We use the responses from those questions to guide the strategy development um, of the climate justice plan. And, and talk about a, a little bit about the uh, answers you got to those and how you compared those with what you were used to seeing. Sure, so we heard about people not having access to heat, period, regardless of how much carbon was in that heat, inoperable windows, um, uh, air pollution. Um, there were members of our Racial Environmental Justice Committee that um, you know, would often not be able to join us because they were taking their kid to the hospital for another asthma attack. Um, and you start to just really understand the layering of the issues and how that affects people's ability to engage and participate. Um, there's also a, a good example um, following the plan. So after the plan was released, we were developing a, um, a community choice aggregation program where the city goes out and procures um, electricity for all the residents of the city. And the idea is that you get hopefully a cheaper rate and you can ask for more uh, renewable energy in that electricity mix. So we had an engagement process and wanted to hear what is important to people. And the environmental community came, they were so excited that we're doing community choice aggregation and they demanded 100% clean energy uh, at any cost. We should be paying the full cost of electricity, it doesn't matter what the price is, that is, that is where you know, this is a crisis, we need to meet that crisis and we should be um, paying that full cost of electricity across the board. Um, this was also the beginning of COVID. Uh, there were a lot of uh, even more insecurities than um, normal around cost of living and uh, people were of course getting laid off and losing their jobs and not uh, a lot of uncertainty about how um, ends would be um, met. And it was um, pretty, uh, so we, we heard from that community, the environmental community, and we also heard we continued to work with the Racial and Environmental Justice Committee to engage um, BIPOC communities and frontline communities. And of course, they supported green energy. They wanted as much renewable energy as possible, but they didn't want to see the prices go up. And so that's where we ended up, how we developed the program. There was an option, if you could afford it, to go to 100% renewables. Um, but we ensured that the opt-in default rate would not be more expensive. Um, and then there would even be uh, an option to like opt down to minimum standard of renewable energy so you could have even a cheaper rate. But it was a little um, shocking and disappointing to hear the environmental community uh, come out so strongly and aggressively and with so much disregard for the um, for low-income communities that might be struggling to pay their electricity. I want to get back to that, but let's uh, open up to some questions because I think uh, our students who've been actively engaged in thinking about this for a while should weigh in. Hi. Um, could we hop a few slides back to your um, energy, well, the carbon emission reduction slides? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems like a majority of the carbon emissions reductions happened between uh, 2005 and around 2010, 2009-ish. 
Um, well, there has also been a slight decline, obviously, after that. Um, it has been far less dramatic. And so what I'm curious about is what happened then to cause such a steep decline um, and why is that level of decline no longer possible now? Mm. Or at least no longer preferable or desirable? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's not preferable or desirable. It, I think a lot of the decline that we saw in the beginning was um, contributed uh, largely by fuel switching that happened at the um, grid level. So that around that time, there's a big shift from um, to natural gas from coal and oil uh, fired power plants. Um, so all over New England, all, all of everyone sort of got the benefit of that in terms of carbon reduction. Um, but then uh, Northeastern has also been investing in um, energy efficiency improvements along the way too. So that's where you see a more gradual um, decline as well. Things from lighting retrofits, um, and, and you know, lighting retrofits may have played into that early decline too. Lighting is a pretty like low hanging fruit, um, and um, a lot of those benefits have we've already reaped. Right? There's not more uh, light bulbs to change to LEDs and see that decline, and, and the the reductions <clears throat> that um, or the savings opportunities become much more expensive and um, more um, more challenging. Yeah, and I have uh, one more question about the carbon credits specifically. Mm -hmm. So what went into this, the decision to specifically purchase the carbon credits rather than invest that money in power saving or other emission right. reducing uh, investments? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I don't have um, an answer to, but I'd be happy to follow up um, and look into that for you. But um, going forward, I do know that regulations will be largely driving that decision. The uh, city of Boston has a building energy reporting and disclosure ordinance that uh, requires um, large buildings, and including you know, our campus, to not only disclose and report their emissions from their buildings, but also to start meeting certain standards over time. And over time, those standards will be lowered, or I guess the standards will be higher, the threshold will be lower for how much um, buildings will be allowed to emit. And one way, if you're over that threshold, if your buildings are inefficient and have high emissions um, that go beyond the threshold, you can invest in offsets or you can pay the fine. And so the city is developing regulations around um, what those offsets would look like. There's different classifications and, and um, factors that go into that. Can you talk about your work with the city and the kinds of things you were doing? And uh, with Boston? Yeah. Um, from my current role or previously? Previously. Previously. Sure, so I worked um, for a couple years um, in the Environment, Energy, and Open Space Cabinet, and um, I worked on the Greenovate Boston program, which was the city's uh, sort of citywide sustainability um, engagement and marketing effort. Um, the city of Boston has a lot of different departments that touch upon climate and sustainability. So Green of Eight Boston was a way to sort of bring those together under um, an umbrella sort of brand and um, actually helped um, uh, develop the first version of that ordinance, the building energy reporting ordinance. Um, the first version didn't have those um, performance standards. It just had the reporting disclosure ordinance. Um, yeah, and I was there. I worked under uh, both uh, Menino and, and Walsh. Tell us a little bit about how um, Northeastern itself is powered. I mean, universities use tons and tons of energy. Mm -hmm. um, What's the, what's the basis of our energy use, and what are the uh, uh, tools that we can use at this moment to reduce that? Sure. So um, our heat, most of our a, a significant part, portion of our heat comes from a central heating plant, 
Um, for a while, we were exploring um, converting that to a CHP combined heat and power system, which would be more energy efficient, but still rely on natural gas for its fuel source. Um, we are pivoting because we want to move towards completely fossil fuel free um, heating and exploring many different options from district energy to uh, geothermal to electrification um, and heat pumps. Uh, there's lots of different options. There's lots of different barriers and um, opportunities within all of those different pathways. We're probably going to need a combination of all of them. Um, on the electricity side, um, I think the, the biggest driving factors are the, as we talked about earlier, the um, the source of our electricity and the generation and the fossil fuels that go into that. And then, of course, there's the investments in energy efficiency. And then, of course, then there's behavior, right? So the energy that we all use and um, a big part of our work at the hub is, and with the help of all you, is trying to increase engagement and um, shift behaviors. And, of course, you know, behaviors aren't the end-all, be-all. Um, but it, it, is, it is an important part of the solution set. Um, I was just wondering where the number 2040 came from for um, switching completely away from fossil fuels because in, I mean, we all know that action needs to happen as soon as possible and 2040 just seems pretty far away for a plan that's ambi so ambitious in other regards. Yeah, I think, um, it, again, it's draft, so I, I really appreciate the feedback, and um, I would encourage you all to, to push us on that. Um, it is uh, a number that um, seemed doable. I think um, it, could, it could certainly um, be more aggressive um, if, if we really... Um, we're, we're pushed on that, so, um, but essentially, I mean, it's, it's sort of relative to other universities and um, and the, the Paris Agreement and, and other standards that are um, being set. I mean, you mentioned we're not moving fast enough, um, certainly, and, and so we do need to be more aggressive. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, I would just say I think um, we'd be happy to explore how, how we can be more aggressive on that front. Who decides that ultimately? We all do. That's the fun part. <laughs> um, so it's going to be, we mentioned, you know, we're really striving to be accountable to frontline communities, um, but we have to find the sweet spot between university leadership, neighbors, our frontline communities, and the northeastern community. Those are our three stakeholder groups, and we're going to find the areas where they overlap. In Boston, what are you finding are the um, uh, main issues that are being raised by the so-called frontline communities, our black and brown communities that are uh, adjacent to us? Sure. So I can maybe go back to that slide to talk more. But I would start with housing. You know, that is one that um, keeps keeps coming up. I hear a lot of, a lot of that um, in the news, and um, it's, it's certainly one that we're going to have to address. Um, you know, in, in Northeastern, we don't build affordable housing. It's not our main mission, is not housing, um, at least not for, for uh, beyond students, but um, we are, um, it's an important priority to the community, and we're going to have to figure out how to um, acknowledge that and uh, and also not overpromise. I mean, we've worked on that in the past in partnerships with Madison Park and others. Mm -hmm. uh, is is my recollection. Um, to what extent does uh, that kind of initiative become part of the university's overall um, interaction uh, with communities? Well, I think the institutional master plan is actually um, the most powerful lever um, that we have. And um, kind of back to the city of Boston a bit, um, there, I think one of the um, 
things that really excites me about doing this work right now is that we're working under a pretty aggressive regulatory structure. So this is no longer about, um, at least when it comes to carbon accounting, it's no longer about how much can we do the right thing. The, the city has imposed um, a pretty solid regulatory structure, at least for building emissions, and um, that is really helping drive decision making. Um, so it's not a voluntary effort to reduce your carbon footprint. This is something that's being demanded of everybody. And if you fail to do it, um, it's going to affect your bottom line. Um, and, and I think with, um, with housing, I don't know what the equivalent of that is, um, but I do know that it's something that um, the, the, the Wu administration is very committed to, and um, I suspect will be challenging many institutions um, through the regulatory process. North, Northeastern is a uh, private entity, uh, but you're also talking about uh, public regulatory structures. Um, how, how do you see policy being balanced, particularly uh, in a city like Boston, where there are so many private colleges, private entities, uh, many of which are uh, tax exempt, um, uh, and the regulatory structure. Um, regulation doesn't necessarily come from uh, the electorate as such. It comes from uh, appointed and, and elected leaders. So uh, how does a private institution respond to that kind of regulation, uh, in your view, and um, in, in some respects become an advocate uh, for um, regulation? So I, I can speak to at least the, the you know, carbon um, side of things. There's um, a lot happening in that space right now, both at the city and state level. Um, there's a, a talk about um, restricting the use of fossil fuels, period, in new construction um, and, and large uh, renovation projects in the city. And certainly there's concern about that, um, but we also recognize that, that that's our goal too. Um, that is humanity's goal uh, that we need to be moving towards. And um, I think that our role as a private institution is to be an active and engaged stakeholder and help ensure that the policies that are developed meet that goal, but do it in a way that is going to minimize any negative unintended consequences. Um, so I think it's about um, good communication and relationships, sharing information and knowledge and expertise, and being clear about um, the challenges that we will face in that. So I mentioned the heating, um, decarbonization. There's no silver bullet for how we get off natural gas for heat. There's lots of, um, so like electrification, for example, we'd have to seriously um, invest in a, a utility infrastructure that isn't owned by us. So the utilities would have to increase the capacity of um, electricity that could come to the campus if we were, in order for us to power and heat all of our buildings with electricity. Um, so it's a coordinated effort, and it's not something that any one sector can accomplish on their own. And so that, you know, that cross-sector collaboration and that stakeholder engagement uh, is really a critical piece. But I think um, just coming back to, I think it's important to, for us to remember that we do share the same goals and uh, we just need to work together to find the best way to get there. The University of Pittsburgh in its 2021 institutional master plan set some very specific sustainability goals. Have you set or do you plan to set specific goals such as increasing that 44% waste diversion rate Yes, um, that is it. those are exactly the type of goals and strategies we hope to set through the Climate Justice Action Plan process. But we'll take a look at that plan. Thanks for sharing. Um, what, 
To the extent of like that it's possible, what role do you think students should play a, a part in the institutional master planning process and I guess development on campus at large? Great question. Um, I, I hope you all um, engage in the IMP process. Um, there's an online map. Uh, you can start to go in there and provide feedback um, and information such as, you know, a lot of it is very basic questions. Where do you like to hang out? Where are your favorite spots on campus? Where do you like to go eat? Where do you live? Just to give um, some more data to the planners and our consultants um, to understand how the campus is being used. So that's really, really important. I would encourage you to um, check that out. And um, I think in, in general, so maybe not specific to the IMP, but um, you know, I would say, broadly speaking, keep um, speaking up and using your voice. And, um, and that's one part, that, you know, I've talked a little bit about how the students really influence the shift from a climate action plan to a climate justice action plan. So you know, we are listening, we wanna respond. Um, we have a student sustainability committee that meets um, every month. And my colleague Megan uh, helps coordinate that. Um, but that's a place where we want to be hearing from students. And uh, we're, we're sharing information about what we're doing, getting feedback from students, and vice versa. Um, and the other thing I, is to, I would say, get involved outside of campus. right? Um, student organizing on campus is very important. Uh, and it's great um, experience. But starting to learn how to be a good neighbor, how to build community and connect a community, whether you're here in Boston or, or wherever you go next. Um, I think those are really um, important ways to contextualize uh, your work and your studies. Just a quick follow-up to that question specifically is, um, and Professor Landmark can uh, attest to this a little bit, but I used to sit on the faculty senate with him last year when the master plan was, was coming out. And one thing I noticed was I was approached by students as a student representative uh, to you know, help them with their divestment campaign. And I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that in particular. But one thing I noticed was that there's this huge disconnect between administration and students. Um, it's hard for students, the normal student, to get in contact with administrators. I know that some individuals on this campaign were interested in looking um, at some data that the CFO of the university could provide. <coughs> So is there any plans to increase that, you know, cooperation and communication between stakeholders you were talking about um, in order to make sure that students' voices are being heard on a more administrative, tangible, policy-making level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, a great question. And um, I'll share experience first that I had with the City of Providence and then um, I think the parallel here at Northeastern. Uh, when we started in Providence, our mayor, who was new at the time, wasn't a climate mayor, um, didn't really um, have a desire to, to lead on that issue. Um, but we worked with the community partners, and we built those strong relationships, and we built a lot of momentum and support. And by the time we were sort of done and the climate justice plan was released, um, it was one of the mayor's favorite things to talk about and one of his proudest accomplishments as, as mayor. And um, I think that's a sort of bottom-up leadership. And, and uh, one of my favorite sayings is figuring out how to influence that authority. And um, there's, there's many ways to do that. And I think there's parallels here. Um, there isn't, it's interesting going from government to university because there's not that, even though our democracy isn't perfect, um, there's not a clear... A lever of influence, like okay, if you know um, I, this person is blocking legislation, well, we're going to work on voting them out of office. Like there isn't that here, um, and so you have to, I think, focus on um, building that grassroots support for whatever it is that you you know, you want to accomplish, and um, and and I, and what you know we hope to do with the climate justice action plan is demonstrate that. There is another way, and hopefully a better way, of engaging with community and being in relationship with community um, that will still accomplish our goals as a university and perhaps even um, help us accomplish them in a more effective way and really be a leader. Um, and so just you know, working towards those, um, whatever process or project that you believe in and, and demonstrating that it works and that's effective. And I think actually that's 
um, one of the great things about Northeastern is that it's very entrepreneurial. And if you do something, you have the resources and the space and the time um, to, to uh, work on whatever it is that you're passionate about. And if it's successful, it will thrive, right? And, and you'll be able to prove that um, via its success. So um, as I said, you know, we're, the, the city landscape and the regulatory landscape has changed. The city leadership has changed. Um, development, pre or development from the university is becoming more challenging in terms of getting things approved by the city. There's a whole shift in, in power happening. Um, and so the time is very ripe to be doing things differently and showing leadership that uh, it can be effective. Are, are there universities that um, are viewed as the real leaders in this field? Um, certainly on sustainability, um, in, on the climate justice side, um, I haven't found, so there are definitely peers who are interested in this and there's an organization called Second Nature that's a higher ed sustainability organization and they have this climate justice working group um, and they're kind of supporting a lot of this work from their organization. <laughs> But I haven't come across, there's no template, there's no uh, model of a climate justice plan for a university um, that I found, at least. I have no question. Oh, great. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Um, can I have one question? Um, it's related to the local businesses. Like, do you have any hotspots for that? Like which area, or do you do you have any kind of you know mapping for that? Like which area you try to you know build these local economies around campus, or you know if you have any information on that, so if you can elaborate on that. So I, we would, um, and and I don't feel free to redirect me if I'm not addressing the question. Um, but I think we what we would, and this will sort of come forward in our process um, is really. The, the community will help us, the community process, those priorities and concerns will help us understand which areas we should be focusing on, where are the priorities, um, and so does that, does that make sense? Is that what you're asking? Okay, great. So TBD. And can you talk uh, in a little bit more detail about what it is ACE is gonna be doing? Yeah, so they will be pretty much running a, a fairly independent community engagement process. So again, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Uh, they know best how to engage their, their community um, here in Boston. So we'll let them you know, run, run that process. And then we'll be working um, with them and the facilitation team at One Square World over the summer. They have some artist facilitators on, on the team. And they'll be sharing the, um, those priorities and concerns from that process over the summer via art. Um, so we're going to be using art as a way to communicate and connect uh, and make sure that information is accessible to the community. There are also a number of um, interesting environmental factors that surround uh, the campus, for example, uh, streams that run mm. close to it, um, uh, social factors like mass and casts, which mm -hmm. factor into uh, some of the concerns that the uh, community uh, expresses. How do those um, both physical and, and social factors enter into uh, the kind of planning you're doing? Yeah, I, I, I think they'll come up in that process with ACE, certainly. Um, but we're, we're still so early on that, that it's, it's hard to tell, to be honest. And it's one of the um, important reasons that we partner with community members and bring them in early is because we don't have all the answers. And they are the, the experts. Well, this is a very um, ambitious um, and some would argue um, uh, aggressive way uh, of uh, approaching uh, resilience and how the university as a stakeholder interacts um, with the local community. Um, do you see this uh, process being used at any of our other campuses, and if so, when? Um, and um, 
what do you think that means in the long term for um, how the university is perceived in those communities, mm -hmm. uh, given the general mistrust that seems to exist is between uh, uh, university campuses yeah. and adjacent communities? So we're working right now with our consultant team to explore what would it take to include the global system in this process, and can we actually do that well with the resources that we have? Um, I think uh, one thing that's really exciting about having this global network is you get to experience and explore these issues in the various contexts of, of different places. And, but this work is very much place-based, and it's community-based. Uh, so we can't just take what we learn here in Boston and take the priorities and concerns and the strategies that are developed based on those in Boston and say, OK, now this, we're going to take this to Oakland, too. And, and this is going to be our plan for Oakland. Um, so I'm excited to sort of explore the, um, the areas of contrast and similarity. And, but we're going to have to do processes to build those relationships and identify um, issues and in in, in those priorities and concerns and the appropriate strategies to address them elsewhere. I think um, that being said, there's definitely opportunities to share knowledge and share lessons learned across the, the global system. And there could be a lot of similarities. I mean, affordable housing is an issue just about everywhere in this country, especially in, in major cities and especially in the Bay Area. Um, so maybe we come up with some solutions that uh, are effective there, but we just can't skip that step, that relationship step, um, and making sure the work is always being done um, in, uh, with that accountability to frontline communities and in the specific place. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is uh, uh, a rather innovative and certainly an extremely thoughtful approach to uh, thinking through some issues that uh, leave a lot of people kind of flummoxed, frankly. Uh, it's easy to talk in the abstract about the need for um, uh, some kind of uh, change in the relationship uh, between stakeholder universities and their adjacent communities, uh, particularly around issues of sustainability. Uh, it's something very different uh, to actually be effectuating that. Um, so I, I want to thank you for your leadership in that regard. And um, as long as we don't have further questions, uh, could our uh, in-house audience uh, Give a round of applause to Leah Bradford. We'll have to come back in a couple of years and see if it was effective. We'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks.